Hey y'all, it's 7.21 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 9th, in the year 2019, but it's anybody's guess. Uh, today, I'll tell you, just uh, right off the bat, be honest, if uh, my energy levels seem a little bit down or my cadence uh, is, is less than it should be, uh, please bear with me. Uh, yesterday I endured, uh, let's see, the first course of what they call CHOP. It's just an acronym for the substances they give you. Uh, CHOP chemotherapy. And so this is this is morning number one after. Uh, in some ways, do I feel a little odd? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, they, they just... They put you on all of these various regimens of of medications, and I mean, you know, I've got a a port in my chest, and I now I've got a another device that they put on the back of your arm that actually it's delivering uh, a a certain substance needed. At a peak time to to fight certain toxicities, um, and I mean, my my arms already from just the last week or so of various procedures leading up to this, and then complications that were occurring um, because of the way that this cancer has had to develop. Uh, you know, my my lower arms look like. Uh, a colander of uh, various port sites so um, but you know it happens to a lot of people this happens to a lot of people and um, I'm gonna tell you something right now this is this is the truth uh, from my position and I'm not gonna take up a lot of time on this video but you know I know there's there's enough people out there who are concerned enough with what's going on and let me just interject this the issue of alternative health and allopathic versus homeopathic the uh, really the the evils injected into allopathic medicine by the um, by the ambitions of, of folks like like Rockefeller and beyond uh, you know people that have been behind him and and behind the scenes the whole time um, with you know uh, the the AMA and uh, an FDA big pharma and and how they've turned something that I do not see as wholly uh, evil uh, <laughs> Uh, in its inception or design or practice or delivery but what it is is it is unfortunately it is a system that ambitious people and greedy people powerful people um, have been able to construct a a very tight wall around concerning the levels of knowledge and understanding that say any decent physician is able to acquire and apply and you see it's very much that way in a lot of forms of alternative medicine and, and homeopathy and stuff you know those people can't just do whatever the heck they want um, if they're practicing you know the thing is my biggest thing is I think that an individual should have the freedom to do what they see as best with their body because any individual if you if you're concerned about your longevity your body your health and your being you're going to be more on top of everything that has happened to you physiologically over the years better than any physician 
And, you know, every single physiology is as unique as the fingerprints on your hand. And I am no exception. So, I've had to find, through uh, a great amount of trial and error, and also being in a position where I had a cancer that was diagnosed over three years ago, and because of the type of cancer it was, and its nature, and the fact that it's low grade, it begins as low grade, and it tends to progress slowly and steadily. I have had to endure such a great deal of trauma because of it before treatment ever even commenced. Now, most of the people I know who were diagnosed with, with cancer, usually it was found in, in a routine or an unroutine test of some sort or another. And because of the type it was, where it was, um, whatever um, oncological history there is of that type of cancer, however aggressive and everything, it frequently ends up to where um, those people will oftentimes experience um, the greatest amount of difficulty and suffering and damages and things like that from treatment, depending. And there's a lot of different kinds of doctors out there because there's a lot of different kinds of people out there. And the doctors who actually care, even though they're in a, you know, this allopathic medicine, absolutely controlled by big pharma, absolutely about the bottom line, absolutely about the dollars, very much about culling the population and certain portions of the population, and we know that. Um, some are able to do more good than others. And because of various individual physiologies, let's say like my own, it would have a whole lot to do with, besides the fact that there's other factors to this than just the type of lymphoma I have, physiologically. I have endured, uh, and I'm going to tell you this right now, I can, I can say this with all confidence. I have endured nearly every form of alternative treatment, both popular and obscure, on my road to get to this point with none of them availing. And we're not talking about fly-by-night. We're not talking about I got a little bag of apricot kernels and ate them for a week or two and decided it wasn't doing anything. I went full bore on literally every possible type of alternative treatment that could be put in my hands based on my means and my budget and what I could do. And I've been through many of them. So when people send me messages or when they send me emails with ideas for alternatives to the chemo and rituximab and, and the basic allopathic medicine, the typical oncological allopathic course of medicine, first off, let me say, I do appreciate um, the care and the attention. Um, and just, you know, taking the time, that I appreciate that. I do. Um, but know this, uh, I've been through years of it now. Years of it with literally nothing providing any kind of real relief. And it's hard to even express the, it, the physical and psychological pain that I've gone through. It's been far beyond, I think, what's typically reasonable. And it's all been for a good reason, and I do not regret it, and I, I, I don't despise it. Um, I'm, I'm thankful for all of it. So, that's it. Just, 
just that little update and and that word um, because you know I have a lot of mixed mixed feelings about the contrast between the the ultra limitations of allopathic medicine which is essentially enforced by law and all the physicians out there who actually do care that find when they get through medical school they get through their residencies they get into their practice they get to having patients that they begin to take care of and I, I believe a lot of them absolutely see this as they care for their patients. That's not everybody, but there's enough of them out there. For me to, for me to say that both me and many other people out there, I think have been far too quick to judge all of them across the board because of the situation they're in. Now, when they get to a point and they find out that not only are they in this situation, and yeah, if, if they go against the system in certain ways, they'll take away their license. They'll never practice again. They could have, they could have mountains of debt, and they could have spent, my goodness. I know people that between their, 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 all their prereqs into their med school and then specialty schools, well over a decade well over a decade and then there's that whole chunk of your life and all that education and what do you do with it now so I understand that but we all have to respond to our conscience and we all hopefully not all of us okay but those of us who do have a conscience some of our consciences are more sensitive than others. We have to respond to them. If we don't respond to them, they're going to be seared eventually. And then we're dead. And we're useless. So, that's that. Got an interesting one, though, today. And this, this is why I'm making a video today. Because I, I couldn't figure out what to do today. And, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's that day after the big chop chemo, you know, and you kind of, I don't know what to do. I don't know. You know, I don't, I don't want to go into, I don't want to go into any, any hard studying. Um, I didn't want to work on the video aspects of the video I'm producing for the paper on Euphrates because that would be, you know, that'd be intense. I don't want to do that. Um, I'm totally good with, you know, making a video on the Sabbath. Um, in the past, I've kind of uh, kind of teetered on that, you know. How much like work is that? Well, not really much like work to me. Uh, all those other things are far more like it. And since uh, <laughs> we're talking about common labor, it doesn't have much to do with that. Um, but I did have somebody ask a question concerning how can we even know that the Sabbath has is, is been carried over in perpetuity with all the calendar changes. Um, and that's a good question, too. Uh, I think that <clears throat> what Chip brought to light in the two videos uh, that I had him on and interviewed him, where he talked about any good astronomer, and he includes Scaliger, in that as a, a good astronomer, a good calculator of astronomy. Now that, that doesn't mean that he's saying that Scaliger was right on the money concerning his chronology per se because of the potential issues that there are with chunks of astronomical time that could potentially be added or subtracted from a calendar, but I think the point that he made, and I hope, hopefully I'm going to express this correctly, was that although these big chunks of time uh, in the range of 300, 600, 900, 1200, you get the point, years, um, can be exchanged, added or subtracted. 
um, because of the way that heavenly bodies move, and they are the ones that are moving, um, a tracking can be done down to the day of the week. And that should just go to make sense. Look, for anybody, anybody out there that is viewing biblical history as absolute and factual history, which I do, and have never made any bones about it. Um, in fact, I had, well, I get this all the time. I had somebody accuse me of, of not being able to be objective if I look at biblical history as, as factual history. And I'm not sure how that is the case because anybody who pays enough attention, and usually it's somebody who watches part of one video that will say that, part of one video. And you're not even looking, looking at any of my backlog. You're not looking at the fact that I have started out in one type of, of theology, one type of eschatology, and had to abandon that type of eschatology because it did not work. I've had to abandon various theologies because they're just that. They're man's theologies applied to what we have is we have a series of documents that have been bibliocized over the years. And we have to understand these at their core levels first. That is important. And in the meantime, I, I think it's, it's very productive to also understand that there is a degree of understanding that we do currently have of these documents. It's not a great one because, and I brought this up before, mostly because so much finagling has been done with the understanding of what words are in Obri. Um, and unfortunately, I, I'm having to come up with, with an entirely new vocabulary to even talk about Obri, to explain it. Things like complete words. Well, what's a complete word? A complete word is a word that is as it does. So like you might see in, in Genesis 1 or Genesis uh, 7, this type of life form that is called Ramash, R-M-S-H, Ramash. Well, what is a Ramash? Can't be 100%. Seen a lot of different interpretations. Nobody can actually prove that. But a Ramash does Ramash. That's correct. What is a Ramash? It does Ramash. Now there's something very fascinating and insightful about the fact that Obery is full of these complete words. What is it? It is as it does. Okay, now the deity, uh, for lack of a better term, the God of the Bible, has a name that he goes by. It is, in English, or the best English equivalents, Y E U, not you, close, U E, E E U E, Yahweh. Now, if we can trust, and I'm not taking just Masoretic guidelines here, okay? I am taking a preponderance of the evidence found within the text on how these various characters, not letters, but characters, because they are ideographs, work with one another. E, U, and E, because most words are either two character or three character roots. Mostly they can go down to two character, but frequently you'll see them in three, and there's a reason for that. E, U, E, will be, as opposed to existing like E, 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 U, E, will be. The Y in the front, quite commonly, but not always, but most commonly, he will, he will be. That name when you say, who is he? When Masha had to go and tell the rest of the children of Yisrael, who sent him? 
You tell him, Yehuwah. Well, what is Yeh? Well, it, is it a name? It is a name, but it's not just a name. It's what he is. It is his substance, his action. You see, that is a complete word. It is what it does. You know, like Forrest, you know, Forrest, he's as stupid is as stupid does. Right. So it's full of complete words. And to really understand what's being said here, and this is the reason why I'm going to continue to approach it as history, as factual, because for one thing, this, this is really hypocritical of anyone who is in, in, in any way critical because I'm approaching it like that. If you as a researcher or as anti, any level of intellectual, if you're not approaching something in a way in which you start with the best possible paradigm you have based on all the available information that you have been able to gather and consider up to that point. If you're not starting with that as your base and working from it and allowing the light of additional fact to affect and influence that paradigm and change it as it need be, then you suck as a researcher. You have to start that way. You have to work that way. How are you going to work? Are you going to say, I'm a serious researcher, and what I'm going to do is I am going to absolutely forget everything about everything that I've ever learned and experienced throughout my life up to this point, and I'm going to start with someone else's paradigm, some guy I don't even know, and I'm going to work from there. It just doesn't make any sense to me at all. So I guess, I guess that's one of the reasons I don't even reply to a lot of those comments. Because they're not thought out. You're, you're not thinking those things through. I have never hidden in anything I've ever done. When I started reading history, fiction, or science, I didn't hide the fact that I looked at the Bible as real and serious history. As a conglomeration of documents that have issues. They've got issues. It's got Masoretic issues. It's got King James issues. It's got our interpretive issues. And it very may well have insertion issues. And perhaps even takeaway issues. But the best way we can find out what those are is to understand it by its source root language, and therein is the whole point of Obri. So, hey, that was 23 minutes talking about other things than my topic, but uh, so what? If you don't want to hear me talk, I don't know, go, go to the Red Elephant channel. Yeah, the Red Elephant channel. <clears throat> he just did a little bit on, uh, what did he do? Well, he's been commenting a little bit on this uh, S1. Uh, S1. I didn't know he was going to either. Uh, you know, he, <laughs> he like a lot of other people out there that, that are you know, basically like, you know, the new alt-media pundits. Um, let's, come on, man, let's be serious. They, they, they typically avoid the JQ, which is the worst thing you can do concerning these subjects that we're talking about is avoiding the JQ. Because what? Then you're just going to, you're just going to pit blacks and whites. Um, you're just going to pit Muslims and whites. Is that what you're going to do? You're going to, you're going to, 
you're going to pit the white world, first off defining it as white world, not even considering the fact that there's so many beautiful sub-tribes within the white world, but it's a white world. We've been jammed together. There's a reason that uh, all of us tribes have been jammed together as, uh, as one people when for so long we always had an identity uh, separate from one another. This is uh, a very recent phenomenon that they have been uh, stripping those things away and just making it a white thing. And there's a reason for that. It's all coming to a head. But uh, they keep wanting to do that. They keep wanting to stir the pot between, you know, white, black, white, Arab, white, Asian, white, Indian, you know. And, of course, they do the greatest disservice by leaving the JQ out because therein is the key to it all. That's one of the keys. It's, it's a big it's a big factor. So, today, today, I'm going to talk a bit and I'm hoping I can actually uh, I didn't try to condense down these little portions of this because it's a big subject. And this is all leading uh this is all leading towards the the research that I've been doing in geography uh and the presentation that I'll be doing soon unfortunately <laughs> I found out I've got to do this presentation again through um mo <laughs> movie maker windows Mo I've got a terrible system my computer is terrible. I'm lucky. I've got it's a 64-bit system. Okie dokie. It's four gigs of uh, RAM. You cannot run anything serious on those kind of gigs of RAM. Not these programs. They won't even have it. I tried to put one on. I put one on. They said that that was their minimum system requirement. So I put it on, and it still rejected my computer. I cannot do much with this computer. I really do hope I get a better one. I'd really love to make better presentations because I was trained for years in, in graphics. That was that was really what I, I invested a lot of my time into years ago uh, before I figured out everybody who was, who was running the graphics industry were all techie people because they had far more... the. It wasn't as, as graphical user friendly, so it wasn't as easy for true artists to come about the knowledge of expressing themselves in some ways as it was easy for somebody who could write HTML and Java um, to sort of dominate that field. And so I got out of it. I went back to carpentry. Lucky me. But I could, you know, I would love to do better presentations someday. So this is this is just all leading up to it. I don't know how many people pay attention to what the teachings of the Mormon or LDS churches. Now, I I know there is public face. And I'm not saying that in the same way as somebody who's using sophistry to uh, to subtly say, you know, we're looking at a total cult. I've read enough Mormon authors. I've known enough Mormons personally. I went to school with people who were Mormons. They were in our public school. Um, for any of you who are familiar with the New York Dolls, and I, I came from a punk background. I'm 44. Uh, the earliest kind of music I ever really loved and started playing in a band was punk music. So, um, when the documentary um, New York Doll was produced about Arthur Kane, 
uh, I watched that Arthur Kane uh, was a, an extremely destructive, self -de self destructive individual who, over the course of his life, um, became involved with the LDS uh, and actually got himself a job at their uh, records library. Um, not in Salt Lake. I, it was their records library. Uh, I want to say it was one of the records libraries they had in L.A. or outside of L.A. Pretty interesting movie, actually. But, you know, the the point of it was the fact that you're going to know a lot of LDS and not even realize they're LDS. Be it people you're going to work with, people you're going to meet, you're going to uh, maybe part of civic organizations with, and you're not going to know they're LDS. Um, and in fact, you know, they're probably not going to come around knocking on your doors because they typically send their uh, their late teenagers to do that kind of thing because by then they're considered um, elders. <laughs> You can have elders come knocking on your door that are 18 years old. Strangest thing in the world. But uh, I'm not really here to to hack on them or criticize them. Uh, I know there's going to be some inadvertent criticizing I will do. It's, it's definitely not deliberate or mean-spirited per se. But I think Joseph Smith is such an important character in the development of what we of what we understand about our land the americas and fur furthermore i think he was a really really instrumental figure in possibly taking a historical narrative that could have found itself spinning out of control, out of control of the hands of people who I think by that time were seeing that they were going to have serious trouble between the expansion westward that the United States was now taking more and more heavily because people wanted away from the East. They wanted away from the East. And they wanted away from the East because who was in the East? In the East were the same merchants that brought all the white slaves here. In the East, what had developed was the same garbage that they knew of back in Europe where they most of them were stolen from. In the East were the banks. Um, I can absolutely see why so many were not all that anxious to stay in the East. And these bankers and these power brokers, as much as they wanted to continue giving usurious loans to hard-working whites that would continue to expand territory westward, northward, southward, successfully, because that's what we've been blessed in doing. And they knew, based on their numbers, that there would be, they would eventually own all the land. They knew that because that's how usury works that's 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 why anyone can make the solid case and be strong when you make it that this whole land was actually stolen from those who developed it not the little packs of nomads who wandered around it murdered each other um, but those who actually developed it and it was all stolen from them through usurious loans. Those same people, by the way, who were mostly just roaming around nomadically and oftentimes killing one another or anyone else they could and torturing them to death 
in the most exquisitely disgusting animalistic ways. You know, they still have tons of land, by the way. They're still all getting government checks from the, those, wait a minute, from the same people who developed this land, made it so comfortable for everyone else to live in, all while getting it stolen from them by the usurious bankers who were just the progeny of the slave ship holders that brought the white slaves here in the first place. How about you? So while you had all these, all these people that were anxious to get away from that same old garbage in the East that they had endured back in Europe, for those who even remembered, we're generations in by now, but there's still people, there's still people coming over. A lot of them coming over through empty promises. You have to remember that. This land, this land was not peopled by a bunch of, whatever propaganda you've ever been told about this land just being absolutely peopled by, by, by what, by greedy people, um, Oh, you know, all these settlers came out for this, that, and the other. Not initially. If you know human nature, then you know it is not human nature for tons of people to pick up out of nowhere and just move for some of the paltry excuses that they give us for freedom of religion. Well, <sighs> Tons of countries today do not have freedom of religion and are filled with all kinds of people that have different religious ideas than that state allows. And they ain't moving. They have family there. They're not going to move away from their family. They know the place. Come on, we got to think, 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 think. How did this country, how did North America get populated? Not worry too much about South and Central right now. North. That's where my people are. So now you get Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith is in a, a really interesting position. And he's been made out to be, at first... And this is for general public consumption. Not, I don't know how much they. I don't know how much of the propagandistic Joseph Smith they feed to LDS. But I think they feed a ton of propagandistic Joseph Smith just, just to the general public. He's painted to us as kind of a lone nut treasure hunter. Um, a dreamer, tall tale spinner. Um, a water diviner, whatever those people are with the sticks. I don't know if it works. Don't tell me. Maybe you can comment. Does it work? I don't know. I've never seen it. I don't know anything about it. But if it does, it probably works because of magnetism, because I think there's a ton having to do with water and various forms of magnetism. They call them the divining rods, right? Where they actually use them to try to find where a vein of, of artesian water would be. They can dig a well, right? I'm not sure that that's witchcraft. I think it's probably a little bit more scientific and has a lot to do with magnetism. Uh, electromagnetic fields. Anyways. So they'll tell you that he was kind of all into that. Just just a good old, good old fashioned frontier all around charlatan. However, uh, his family was from New York. Now, up until relatively recently, I thought he had spent most of his time in New York, that he had done most of this uh, preliminary work on what eventually became known as the Book of Mormon in New York, and that it was simply 
during their travels where they ended up in uh, Illinois, Missouri, and, uh, and Smith got in his trouble. And I don't know how much is true about that story either. Uh, the way he met his demise and who they said did it and why they said he did it and the specifics to it and the way he was supposed to have raised his arms in a Masonic way and said, is there no justice for um, uh, whatever they use that phrase because it, had, it goes back to the whole Hiram Abiff um, mythos in Mormonism like a mother's son, something like that, you know, he says. I don't know how much of that is true. How much of that do you know is true? I think there's all kinds of things about Joseph Smith's life that we don't know about. His connections, we don't know about. Why he was out in Nauvoo, Illinois, we don't know about. We have been fed such a load of crap about so much in our past, why would any of us just believe any of it at face value and, and still claim to have a brain? And after I read this little paper, which is at a fascinating site, by the way, it's, it's called something like the Gnostic Archive, and basically it has like a, a really wide variety of, of different subjects, articles, things like that, that you can find out about a lot of different things. And you end up finding about <laughs> finding out things about Joseph Smith yeah, this that are pretty crazy. So let's look at a little bit about Joseph Smith, some factors that nobody ever told us that are going to be so important to why there is the, the, uh, the Book of Mormon story as it exists and why you have such a huge segment of, of these men and women with bright, brilliant, wonderful minds, by the way, and so oftentimes um, a lot of resources, because these people can, can essentially challenge uh, the big boy institutions, you know, like the Smithsonian and other government assets trying to oftentimes uh, commandeer and destroy artifacts, records, clues, um, many, 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 many things that they discover. They have actually been more responsible for holding more North American artifacts and other discoveries um, in trust than anyone else has. And for that reason alone, I consider the um, Mormon researchers and hands-on digging in uh, archaeologists and artifact hunters, um, I consider them a great asset of mine. Uh, and you've got to look for you've got to look for all the help you can get in any possible area, especially when it comes to an area like this where it seems like, no pun intended, so much has been buried. So let's see. Joe Smith. Now I can tell you already, and and it has nothing to do with the uh, the preemptive time I took on this video, which I always take on videos. Do you people know me? It has nothing to do with that. This is this is this is some real meat and potatoes stuff, guys. It really is. Take my word for it. This is this is this is going to factor so much into so much we're going to learn about actual history. It's indispensable. So this this is going to be at least a few parts talking about this. It's fascinating too, by the way, because we're going to touch on a lot of various things in here. And you know, as soon as you start touching on these, these issues, when you start bringing up things like the Kabbalah, when you start bringing up things like Talmud, Mishnah, 
and the you-know-whose dots get connected. One of the things that, that struck me was at the very beginning of this. It said, this work was originally published in Dialogue, a journal of Mormon thought, volume 27, number 3, fall 1994, pages 117 through 194. I think that's fascinating. <sighs> because, uh, for one thing, I did not know that the Mormons, in general, if this is like an official Mormon publication, and it sounds like it is, the guy who did this is, I mean, he would consider himself um, a Mormon, I, I believe, and, and, and a, a Mormon historian and researcher at that. I didn't know they, I didn't know they published this sort of information about their history, their founder, etc. Et, <laughs> et cetera. <laughs> I know I say that wrong. I'm American. Et cetera. <laughs> Ah, uh, it's okay. Let's see. Um, so yeah, it's pretty amazing that it it's not something that was public published in the fringe. You know, this guy had to either self-publish or find a fringe publisher outside of LDS to publish this stuff. This was published within, I guess, what what you would consider the sphere of LDS. And I'm, I'm saying LDS instead of Mormon. I know that, that they typically prefer to be called LDS. And it's they've been calling themselves LDS for so long instead of Mormon. Sometimes people don't recognize Mormon before LDS. So I'll just be switching up back and forth. But the title of this is Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah, the Occult Connection. And it's by a man named Lance S. Owens. In 1973, RLDS, so that's, uh, if I know it right, it's Reformed Latter-day Saint, a little bit different movement. RLDS historian Paul M. Edwards identified a fundamental deficiency of Mormon historical studies. Quote, we have not allowed, unquote, says Edwards, speaking of Mormon historians, quote, the revolutionary nature of the movement from which we have sprung to make us revolutionaries, unquote. He continued, the one thing about which we might all agree concerning Joseph Smith is that he was not the usual sort of person. He did not approach life itself or his religious commitment in a usual way. Yet the character of our historical investigation of Joseph Smith and his times has been primarily traditional, unimaginative, and lacking in any effort to find or create an epistemological methodology revolutionary enough to deal with the paradox of our movement. The irony of our position is that many of our methods and interpretations have become so traditional that they can only reinforce the fears of yesterday rather than nurture the seeds of tomorrow's dreams. Now that is profound. That is profound. That, that a Mormon would be that candid, I would say, because that illustrates that deficiency between what all of us normies, us non-Mormons, are told about Mormonism and Joseph Smith, and what those who have grown up in, who have immersed themselves in Mormonism, LDS, their theology, their way of life, their practice, which is far different than what any of us that would consider ourselves 
at least coming from an evangelical background or a Catholic background or many other kinds of backgrounds, an SDA background. This is quite foreign to that. And so to have these perceptions now aired out before us, I think it's an uncanny thing. So let me continue. More than two decades have passed since those words were penned, years marked by a veritable explosion in Mormon studies, and yet Edwards challenge, quote, to find or create an epistemological methodology revolutionary enough to deal with the paradox, unquote, of Joseph Smith remains a summons largely unanswered. Revolutions are painful processes. They are. And we all know who the masters of revolutions are, but I digress. They are painful processes in measure both destructive and creative. The imaginative revisioning of Joseph Smith's quote, unusual approach, unquote, to life and religion demands a careful, though perhaps still difficult and destructive, hewing away of an hundred years of encrusting vilifications and thick layerings of iconographic pigments, masks ultimately false to his lively cast. Smith eschewed orthodoxy, and so eventually must his historians. To that end, there is considerable value in turning full attention to the revolutionary view of Joseph Smith provided by Harold Bloom in his critique of the American religion. How well said. I mean, you talk about refreshing. To, to hear them talk so candidly on Smith. But I continue. Broadly informed as a critic of the creative imagination and its Kabbalistic, Gnostic undertones in Western culture, and perhaps one of the most prominent literary figures in America, Bloom has intuitively recognized within Joseph Smith a familiar spirit, a genius wed in nature to both the millennia-old visions of Gnosticism in its many guises and the imaginative flux of poesy. Poesy. <laughs> Individuals less informed in the history and nature of Kabbalism or of hermetic, alchemical, and Rosicrucian mysticism, traditions influenced by a creative interaction with Kabbalah, may have difficulty apprehending the basis of his insight. Indisputably, the aegis of orthodox, the aegis of orthodox Mormon historiography is violently breached by Bloom's intuition, linking the prophet's visionary bent with the occult aspirations of Jewish Kabbalah the great mystical and prophetic tradition of, I'm sorry folks, Israel, he says. I'm sorry folks, Israel, he says. When in fact, it would be proper to say the great mystical and prophetic tradition of the Canaanites of old. Bloom is, of course, not, not saying our fathers weren't guilty of this, But there's a distinct difference, and I hate seeing it. You guys know that I can't call that country over there Israel. You know I can't do it, right? That's why it's not real. I can't. It's hard enough writing politicians. And I know I've got to put Israel in there. And it's a sham. He goes on. Bloom is, of course, not a historian. Why did he use an correctly before and then just used a? Bloom is, of course, not an historian, but a critic and interpreter of creative visions, and his reading of Smith depends perhaps less on historical detail than on his intuition for the 
poetic imagination. The affinity of Smith for these traditions is nonetheless evident to an educated eye. What is clear is that Smith and his apostles restated, restated what Moshe Idol, our great living scholar of Kabbalah, persuades me was the archaic or original Jewish religion. My observation certainly does find enormous validity in Smith's imaginative recapture of crucial elements, elements evaded by normative Judaism and by the church after it. The God of Joseph Smith is a daring revival of the God of some of the Kabbalists and Gnostics, prophetic sages who, like Smith himself, asserted that they had returned to the true religion. Either there was a more direct Kabbalistic influence upon Smith than we know of, or far more likely, his genius reinvented Kabbalah in the effort necessary to restore archaic Judaism. Now, folks, at this time, I'm going to tell you, there, there's, there's going to be more information that I'm going to give you th that's just in over the course of this article, and it's a, it's an extensive article. I, I don't think I'm going to read the whole thing because it's just that the amount of various aspects of what he believes made up the entire belief system of Joseph Smith, which are all important, by the way, guys, because we've been sold a dream concerning him and Mormonism in the LDS Church, okay? and history in general. Um, so they're all important. But what I'm seeing as so important is the story within the story. If we read this and we consider it and we look, we, we read between the lines, what we're going to see is we're going to see connections there that we've never seen before that I think should start turning the light bulbs on. Why was he involved with these people? Why was, why was he deeply entrenched in this stuff? You know, why is it that um, certain historians who have looked deeply into his life and his writings and his beliefs are going to link him to Hermeticism, Gnosticism, Jewish mysticism, such as the Kabbalah, and more. Um, Jews from, from Europe. Um, and then you see this expression that if you, let's say you watch somebody like a Bill Schneblin, which I wouldn't watch too much of Bill Schneblin, but if because I got to tell you, I don't know about that guy, boy. But if, um, if he's done the work that he says he has in LDS, if he's been in the temples as he says he has been, and if he has drawn all of the proper correlations between LDS and Freemasonry that he says he has, and there's been more than just him. But again, a lot of the people who have, I'm sorry, I find these people questionable in other ways. But if they can be taken at their word to a degree, then it's not a surprise that Joe Smith would be involved in this Jewish mysticism and Probably, it's not just Joe Smith. Remember, guys, any time they effect any kind of revolutionary new paradigm, whether it is a bloody revolution in France, whether it is a revolution of immorality in America post-World War II, there is never one man who's doing this there is a man in the front 
and especially given how sensitive their involvement with things in things would be in certain times because in times past people knew better and 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 they would be very suspicious of these Canaanites being involved in a movement such as LDS, Mormon, or anything else. Anything else. They had to keep more low key, right? You got to put a goy out front. Please don't ever believe that Joe Smith was doing this all on his own. I don't believe it. But if you do enough work and you find enough good material, and you can convince me otherwise. Well, that's one thing. But I wouldn't believe it. Because we find out. We find out. He wasn't going at it alone. So that subtext, we read between the lines. What do we see? <clears throat> we see the, the same sort of characters, and we see the same sort of literary influences, and the same sort of political and social influences. That, that, that spread and have controlled Freemasonry, control Freemasonry and Freemasons to this day in Mormonism. How much of Mormonism is controlled right at the top by the same people, two sides of the same coin, Freemasonry, Mormonism, I don't yet know. So I'm not going to just, you know, point my finger. Are, are some of the uh, researchers and really sharp minds of, let's just say the people who are doing a lot of work at keeping in trust the narrative that goes against the accepted mainstream narrative of American history, those people within LDS Mormonism, are those people at the top controlled? I would have to say no. They're definitely being watched. But within Mormonism, there's far more of a an exterior aspect to it that there is not in Freemasonry. There are, there are too many loyal, sincere adherents to LDS Mormon theology and practice that they can't just go around uh, commandeering and, uh, and stealing these people's hard work that they've been doing trying to... Uh, authenticate their belief system. It, if most of you don't know about Mormon belief system in general, I'm going to give you a, a few quick brush strokes which will help. It's not the whole ball of wax, okay, but it will help. Essentially, the, the core is that those that they call the lost tribes of Israel. So we're talking about all of them who were pretty much displaced at around the time of the first great um, Ashuri invasions or Assyrian invasions, in which many, many tribes, big, huge chunks of tribes that lived on large areas of land, <laughs> And that, of course, they believe in Palestine, uh, were displaced. And what they believe was that through a series of different events, not just then, but before then too, because, you know, there were, there were fluctuations, by the way, from, from the book of Exodus to the book of Deuteronomy. There were, you know, there were censuses taken in numbers. There were censuses taken uh, before they entered the land in Deuteronomy. There, there are numbers given in Joshua, and those had fluctuated quite a lot. And we see that some people had just left. 
it looks like portions of tribes because by the time you get a few hundred years in, okay, Jacob took his family, which consisted of 70 males and then accompanying females and then all the peoples that were with them that were not familial into Mitzrim. And from that point to the point when they were delivered through Masha by Yahweh, it was about 215 years. In that time, there had been about two to three generations. Within two to three generations, and the amount of, of prolific um, breeding, because they were they were breeding and and reproducing at a rate of about I think it's about 4.8 percent, which is actually not that high when you consider that some countries right now are breeding at around six to eight percent. But what what would happen and what did happen was strong factions within families would grow into their own subtribes. And I've seen this, and it's, it's become, uh, in some ways, it's become one of those uh, challenges to me as a researcher because, for instance, um, the tribe of Minashe. Minashe was Joseph's oldest son. Aparim was Joseph's younger son. When Jacob blessed them, he crossed his hands and he put his hand on the young, his right hand on the younger son's head. They did this for good reason, because you look at the history of the patriarchs and how these blessings have worked, <sighs> and even how his own blessing worked. Remember, Jacob was the second born. Oshu, called Esau, was born first. So Jacob, he crosses his hands, he put his hands on the youngest son, gives him the greater blessing, that's Aparim. Then you had Minashe. Minashe would have tens of thousands, Aparim hundreds of thousands, that sort of thing, or thousands, tens. At, okay, Minashe has a son down the line, one of his ancestors, <laughs> who uh, it just so happens his name is Galod. Now the ironic thing about that is that about 300 years earlier, this same area where Minashe settled on the far side of Yarden, away from the rest of the tribes. There's a huge area of land that's called Galod. <laughs> so you have Galod, who takes a lot of Galod anyways. He was a subtribe, so they're subtribes, okay? Well, what they believe is that a number of peoples from what they call the lost tribes and subtribes, that they eventually came to America. Now, what they believe about their spiritual past and all that stuff, like the Jesus, Satan, Spirit, Brothers thing, and... I don't know anything about that. I, I mean, I do know a little, you know, there was this war and everything, and those people who won, uh, they came here as this, those didn't lost, they came here as that, and the different planets, and the fact that the, the guys who didn't even uh, fight in the war were cursed with black skin. I don't know how factual all of that is. Okay, so I'm not going to get into that. I don't know. I've heard, I've heard, I've I've heard some things. <clears throat> but the big thing is, they believe they came to America. And they believe there is this, there is this long, complex, and depth history of them in America. And they, of course, use this for their, this is really the basis, the bedrock of their belief in why all of these artifacts have been discovered so much in America. They'd, 
So much so that the Smithsonian can't even keep track of them all, try to cover them all up and destroy them all. Okay? It's, it's amazing, folks. And they, mainstream press and publishing houses have gone to great lengths to keep even the, even the, um, information of knowing that artifacts like the ones that are found are found. And we're not just talking about like Michigan tablets and the um, uh, there was the uh, ah, it's not a coffin found in Ohio and it slipped my mind. It's got Obery on it. Okay, there's the Lost Luna stone. Some of these have some of these have Obery. Uh, or oriented from left to right. Some have Obery uh, oriented from right to left. Some bottom to top. That is something else that I'm finding out about the older languages. And you can do it with English. Open up a open up a word document. Open up a word document and copy a paragraph. And then and then go to where they allow your orientation because they will allow you to do orientation. Just flip it, mirror flip, mirror flip it. Just in English, simple paragraph. I don't care. Mirror flip it and read it. You will read it quite successfully. You will comprehend it quite successfully from right to left, just as left to right. This thing with them insisting on Obri being Hebrew and being backwards to what we understand with a Western mind is all part and parcel to their agenda of making it seem as though it is a non-Western source language. So that's their, their answer. That's why all the Obri artifacts, that's why all the so-called Phoenician artifacts, that's why all the so-called Aramaic artifacts. That's why all the so-called Egyptian artifacts. And man, if you even knew of all the earthworks that have been leveled, why? 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 You people are, are protecting these huge national parks, you say, just utter treasures and they level they have leveled all manner of earthworks and speaking of I know a lot of people ask me about or want some kind of relatively intelligent uh, comments on Tartaria uh, I'm not the guy. If you want more intelligent comments on Tartaria or that whole vein of uh, research, Tartaria, mud flood, Fomenkoisms, I'm not really the guy because it's not that I don't believe that a great nation once exist perhaps called Tartaria it's not that um, but at this point in time I do happen to believe that Tartaria is being rolled out it is a rollout to distract us from other things now you can think I'm a retard by saying that and that's your prerogative you're free to do so Flat Earth was rolled out. Doesn't mean that the Earth isn't flat, just means that it was rolled out. And they had a reason for that. And anything that I see as a rollout, and the way I see things as rollouts, is based on who's pushing it and how. And I'm afraid most of the people that have pushed the Tartaria narrative in certain ways and mud flood narrative in certain ways in my mind are not to be trusted hate me if you must don't curse me 
So there you have it. And that, that doesn't even begin to go into all of the complexity of the Book of Mormon, like all this. And believe you me, I do not have the time to go through that and carefully read that whole thing. Not today, I don't. Not right now, I don't. I have, I have tried in the past. I have done what I can in the past. It is uber tedium, I'm told. I would imagine there's audiobook versions of it out there too. I don't know I don't know if I could I don't know if I could endure that. I could try. But we're gonna see. Right now Mormonism and Joseph Smith and all of this, it's it's an aspect. It's a really important one. I, I hope I hope all I've said about it so far convinces you of that. Super important. Super important. Um What I'm going to do with this, I've introduced you to this article and what it's going to go into. Some of the things he's going to talk about. He's going to bring to light some really cool things. Now, I have a number of sites also from other Mormon researchers. And these people, by the way, folks, and it's like I've said, I don't want to take anything from them. Because some of them, I wouldn't be as far down the road at understanding certain things about the very serious nature of the real history and landscape of this lovely, wonderful land of ours, if not for LDS. Crazy. Or not. Uh, you're going to see as we go. It's going to be fascinating. It's going to be enlightening. And it could lead us into a lot of places. And I've got a lot more resources uh, than just uh, the couple I mentioned. But trust me. You know, folks, when I, when I came out and I started saying the most likely candidate for the land in which the events of the, Bibles, the Bible happened is North America. And everybody thought I was crazy. They thought I was some nutcase. First off, I'm not a researcher who goes around and makes screwy claims based on something I don't know about. I am not a I am not a YouTube regurgitator. I have to dig in and look at as much as I possibly can concerning any given topic before I feel that I'm even remotely qualified to give you an still an opinion but at least hoping it, it would be a a little more qualified and educated opinion than a YT regurgitator that's not what I do so when I finally came out and I had to start talking about that because I had bit my tongue for a long time concerning that. I had been seeing that coming down the pike for a long time and I didn't say anything. By the time I did, it was just inevitable. So when I say something like that, it is because there has been so much evidence that has been so in my face for so very long that to not tell you, to not challenge you, to not put it out there for your ridicule and criticism, and may I say, far too often, the criticism has come far too quickly without any serious investigation. Now, I'm, I'm pretty patient about a lot of things, but at some point, you know, I do get to a, I do get to a point where I'm just, I just ignore things. If it's just going to 
continually be the same rhetoric, the same criticisms, with, without some good backup, without good, lively, spirited dialogue that, that, that involves some, some time that somebody's going to take to do some work too, well, I feel that's insulting. So I ignore. I, I don't, still haven't banned, still don't censor. I mean, sometimes, geez, I consider it because some of the stupid things people say in comments, they really are. They're really stupid. And I don't know if this is just, if this is just the ignorance bred by social media talking, because that's what they're all about. That's what they want. They want you to become dumber through social media. They put so much garbage into social media to try to make you even more stupid than the television and public schools have. Uh, and I'm not accusing everybody out there of being stupid. Actually, I've met so many intelligent people through this channel and on social media, other creators. Okay, I'm just saying that's what they're up to. And that's so often what I see. Somebody comes, they're going to listen to five minutes, and they're going to they're going to somehow give me an intelligent comment that in some way is going to be worth the time to even read it. And it's going to just change my whole paradigm. That's that's stupid. I really enjoy comments though. I do, especially just just be, somebody had a some something intelligent to offer. And I don't I don't care if it's if if it's, you know, if it's something that that I've already come across, you didn't know, fine. If it's something that's a bit off topic, but I you know, but but it still is productive, that's great. Um, I take the time to look through my comments daily. And what you don't see is that, so even on a new video, maybe, maybe on a new video, I'll, I'll only get four or five comments, but I'll get so many on older videos. And I'll go through those. I'll look through those. And I get emails. Uh, and I get various messages. And I, I try to go through them every day because, first off, I value people. I do. I value people. It pains me that so many of the interactions that I have to have with so many people are, are not productive. Um, but I take the time. So, you know, the kind-hearted comments, those are the ones that are fuel, that keep me going. They are. Because look, I've, I've grown a thick skin over all these years of doing this and trial and error. And I sucked at speaking when I started this. I couldn't, I could not put my thoughts and my words together at the same time. You know, I was a babe in the woods. And I endured a lot of comments about that. Hey, so be it. And I learned. And I improved, and things have changed. Um, the kind comments, I love. I do. If you say you don't or you don't need them, or that's a lie. That's a lie. And you know, to give me those comments, if if they're sincere and they come from the heart, you know, they're 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 not fan comments. I, I've never even looked at them that way. I've like looked at them as comments from from genuine people who genuinely appreciate the exchange that we have. The comments that challenge me, I pay attention to those. I pay attention to comments from my critics. Um, one thing many of my critics, I don't know if they take this into consideration or not, I am a one-man show. So, 
a lot of things that I think they would like to see I can't do. I can do what I can do. So far this is what I can do. So I do it the best I can do. The critics who I have taken a great deal of time to try to explain certain things to who aren't getting it through their heads that I'm not changing my mind about certain things eventually I won't even respond I'll see your name and I won't even read it anymore because seriously what do you expect there's a lot of things that I haven't addressed over a long period of time that that are getting addressed a little bit here but that's the truth man so this is gonna be part one and and I'll pick it up we're gonna gonna do part two and I don't know how many parts are gonna be to this this is important stuff The you know the Ashraf Ezap part with and I you know definitely uh, factored in heavily to Exodus under a microscope not exactly but enough for me to kind of jam it in there I really only wanted to make that two parts and part of the reason for that of course is I do have a great deal of contempt for the great deal of contempt that Ezat has for my Alium. But we're going to take some time with Joe Smith. It's going to be fun. So listen, down below uh, in the uh, description, past the description, there will always be the website address. At the website, um, the resources page is the one that, that I'm really trying to add things to as much as I possibly can. There is, of course, a call for a, an editor out there for anybody who would really would like to be a part of this. Yes, I do do extensive writing. Yes, editing is a huge part of the writing process that sometimes, you know, if I was just a writer, maybe I'd have time to do all that self-editing. A uh, lot of other resources on there. I'm doing everything I can to really actually help people not only understand Obri and the way it works and how to see it outside of Hebrew, uh, but tools to use it doing everything I can and I'm gonna continue as long as I can as long as the father gives me breath in my lungs and you know I can sit upright and use a computer um, you can contact me there I would prefer anything having to do with this kind of work you know contact being done there my 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 personal email that I filter like a lot of stuff through that's in if you just check like some of my older videos you know I'm not gonna write it in every single time because it's a long email I got a long name but you can contact me there for things that are not specifically you know Obrey project and all this related to um, you hit the donate button on the website and that's going to take you to my patreon and I appreciate patronage it does actually help me do more or or dedicate more time to right now the patronage I get it just it doesn't quite cover the cost of keeping the website up I have to put in a few bucks of my own too. So, um, hey, it's just the way it goes. I, I told everybody that when I opened up the Patreon, I said, you know, I'm just going to keep producing as much as I can produce, but I can produce only what I can produce. I still have to go out and work, you know, and support my family. No big deal. Um, but that's, I mean, that is the crux of it, right? I don't make a lot of money. I've never made a lot of money. Um, and now with the cancer yeah, treatments and all that, we don't know. We don't know how productive I'll be or won't be, you know. But um, <clears throat> in those times that I can't do physical work, I'll be doing more of this kind of work. Um, and it'll all equal out. But um, any and all help and support if you believe in what I'm doing consider doing it because it helps it really does so until next time I'm really glad I was able to do this today and uh, 
you're gonna like you're gonna like some of this information that we're gonna pick up on Joe Smith and what happened in America around that time and what that could mean as far as the way history has been altered. So everybody, take care of yourselves. Bye.